I'm doing Revelation on Sunday night. I'm going to look a little bit at Revelation 8 this evening, but want to kind of recap a few things. We've got several people listening online to this study, so that's kind of interesting, and hope they get something out of that. As we looked at Revelation 6, we looked at the scroll written on front and back, totally full, uh, complete revelation of God. In other words, nothing else could be written upon it. The Lamb was the only one that was found worthy to open the book and had seven seals on this scroll. And as these seals were each opened, something was revealed. And as we went through those seals, we begin to see seven. Seven is a complete number. And we've talked about that in the book of Revelation, used 54 times. It's a number of completeness or perfection. So when we see that number, it means it's complete. So the scroll was the complete, rev the complete revelation of the book of Revelation. It was complete in its entirety. As we looked at these seals, we saw the scroll as Christ's eternal purpose for man's redemption. He was the only one that could open it, the only one that was found worthy. And as he opens this, we're introduced to what's going on throughout this book. It's the beginning of this revelation. No person in this vision, the book of Revelation, is identified as a living character. No specific historical event is disclosed. No definite point in time is recorded that would enable the reader to build his interpretation around any of these things. One must rely on John's assurance in 1-1, things which must shortly come to pass. The general period of the church's beginning, which is where in this study we take the book of Revelation, particularly the Roman persecution against uh, Christianity. These are symbols, symbolic pictures. We must be careful about putting literal interpretation on them. We talked about this a lot in this book as we went through this study, what it says, what it means. We have to ask ourselves that continually as we go through this study. <laughs> what is trying to be told by the pictures that are being painted? Visions are being interpreted. Things are written that are not physically possible. And we see those type of things in the book of Ezekiel, uh, book of Isaiah. We see these type of things. Now, as we started opening those seals, we saw the four horses of the apocalypse, we call them. Uh, the white horse, Christ, going forth in the gospel, as symbolized in the scroll. Persecution of saints, which followed the preaching of the truth. The second horse was persecution. The third horse was discrimination in labor and business, which added to the suffering of Christians of that time. The fourth was judgments that fell upon society as a result of the rejection of the divine message. So these seals are revealing. The fifth seal is the souls of the slain under the altar. Said, wait a little while longer, and I will. Then this will happen. And John, we use that idea of a little while. We see that a lot in the book of John. Uh, in John 7:33 in John's Gospel, a little while I'm with you. 7 to 12:35, a little while is the light among you. So we don't take that little while to be two or three thousand years, as we've gone through this study. The six seals judgment, we talked about it's not the final judgment. It's just a third, uh, it's just partial. Uh, we see that in Isaiah, destruction of Judah was related to an earthquake, the fall of Babylon, the sun's dark and the moon and stars cease to shine. And we talked about these Old Testament examples of things we know happened. We know when Babylon fall, fell, the sun wasn't darkened and the moon and stars didn't cease to shine. But once again, what does it say? What does it mean? It's an illustration of what's taking place. Same way with Judah and an earthquake. Same way with the fall of Eden. Heaven being rolled up like a scroll. We know literally that never happened. But we also know that Edom fell. So we look at the Old Testament, at these pictures of the Old Testament, to try to make sense of pictures of the New Testament. So once again, even though it sounds like, oh, this is the end of the world, we know that's not the case because the Old Testament uses these same examples. It was not the end of the world. It's just symbolic what does it say? What does it mean? In Hosea 10, the fall of Samaria says the mountains were to fall on them. Of course, that never literally happened. Once again, it's figurative. So we see the sixth seal as being this judgment upon the earth. As we get through the sixth seal, then we begin, we have an interlude. We've talked about that period, the interlude where the winds are held back. Things happen, assurance in that interlude. In, uh, as we get in chapter 7, there's assurance in that, in that interlude about what's going on. Every one of these Old Testament statements was about the fall of a nation. No different here. We're talking about the fall of Rome, so it kind of makes sense. 
In chapter 7, we have rest. We have the 144,000 who are sealed. We said that represented the church on earth. We talked about that wasn't a literal mark, no more than it's a literal mark. In the Old Testament, when they're sealed, it's a mark from God, a figurative mark, not literal. And then we also talked about the multitude who represent all those of this tribulation, even those that are not necessarily dead. So ones that are still on the earth, they're still standing before God's throne, worshiping the same way we set before God's throne and worship him. And it talks about that whole multitude that's going to go through this persecution of about 270 years in, in Rome from, the, from uh, this time, or actually from the time of Nero all the way to the time uh, when Christianity will be accepted under Constantine. So there's a long period of time, a lot of people in that period. And that kind of just to recap in a little bit, get us up to tonight. I said I'll show you this a lot. We're not done showing it to you yet. Seven seals. The seventh seal introduced the seven trumpets. The seventh trumpet introduced the seven bowls. So there's three different periods in this. Seals, trumpets, bowls. Every one of these has significance. But the seals are revelation. The trumpets are warning. The bowls are action. So as we move from the seals to the trumpets, the trumpets begin to come into a stage of warning. Now in the seals, we have the four horsemen. We have the four trumpets first as we look at the trumpets. So these is kind of how the book of Revelation works. The bowls become our action, but in the middle of this, there's interludes. We looked at the first interlude, the time of rest. There'll be another interlude between the trumpets and the bowls. Then we'll move into the bowls. So as we get into these trumpets in Revelation 8, we begin to understand or we begin to see the warning that's going out into the earth for people to repent, to turn back to God. So God uses a lot of different things to warn us, doesn't he? He uses nature. He uses prophetic words. He uses a lot of different things around us to warn us of what's coming, what's impending. And it's no case in this. Jesus often told them, you know, to observe the signs or the sign of the time. Revelation 8 isn't a really long chapter of Revelation. Um, it says, when the Lord broke, the, the Lamb broke the seventh seal. I guess we could put Lord there, and we would be all right with that. When the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about a half hour. That's kind of significant in Scripture, especially with John. John said, my hour has not yet come, talking about Jesus. He also says, uses actually that term several different times. We look at the concordance in the book of John. It's a pause, if you want to. It's a pause of effect. A lot of times when you're speaking or sometimes when you preach, you'll pause for a minute. Pause for effect. The calm before the storm, maybe. That's what we call that, right? And it's no different here. The reason for the pause is for effect. It's a pause before the storm, a calm before we're going to make this revelation. He's broken the last seal. That's the end of the revelation. Now we're looking at warning. There were seven angels, once again, the number seven used 54 times in the book of Revelation. It's a perfect number. Seven seals, seven angels. Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. Seven angels to sound seven trumpets. Trumpets in the Bible were warning. In the book of, De uh, the book of Numbers, uh, chapter 10, uh, a trumpet was sounded. One trumpet was sounded to call the princes together. Two trumpets were sounded to call the whole assembly together. Trumpets were used to announce, used to warn, and it's no different in the book of Revelation. As we look at these trumpets, it's that annunciation of what's going to come, the warning. You and I, maybe we don't see that as much because we're not, old we're not first century people, but to them, to Jewish people, to those who do the law, trumpets were given for that to sound the alarm. The Bible says, you know, who will respond if the trumpet doesn't sound? So the trumpet is for that. We see that even in 1 Thessalonians, Paul, that the Lord would send the trumpet of God, right, uh, to announce the coming of the Lord. So, so trumpets are used for that. Another angel come and stood at, the, uh, the stood at the altar holding golden incense, and much incense was given to him. And we see that incense, and we talked about that. Incense being the prayers of the saints, and more fire from the altar will be added to that. So incense in the Bible, in, the, in this book of Revelation, and not just in the book of Revelation, also in the Psalms, and we'll look at that a little bit. Incense becomes 
power. It becomes the prayer. So the prayers of us, the prayers of the saints at this time, we're in the throne room of God coming from these bowls, surrounding God, surrounding his throne. In Revelation 5, 8, we looked at that. It says, each one holding a harp, a golden bowl of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So we get this idea of the prayers being engulfing God in the throne room of God, the prayers going up, why are you being persecuted, how long will we be persecuted, um, what are you going to do about the persecution, would you help us with this persecution? You can imagine all the prayers going up to God at this time. And the psalmist says in 141.2, it says, May my prayer be counted as incense before you, the lifting up my hands is the lifting up of my hands is the evening offering. So once again, the idea of incense being prayer, not unique to the book of John, but here it's very, very much something that we see um, before us in this imagery. It says, um, and once again, what's it say? What's it mean? We can, we can understand the imagery of this incense being engulfing all in the room, all around you, all around God. Very powerful imagery. But in this case, he takes this, this fire of the altar, and he, and he throws it to the earth. And every time, you know, we see that, there were peals of thunder, sounds, flashes of lightning, an earthquake. Once again, all these things, symbolic things of power, of God's presence. Uh, thunders, lightning, thunder, that's very reminiscent of Moses going up to the mountain of God. Um, these things are very much about the idea of the power of God, the power of what's going to happen, a warning to those on the earth that, that these things are going, to, are going to happen and that these things are going to be powerful and that things are going to occur. Um, this warning that comes out and you say, well, you know, literally this didn't happen, but, you know, in a figurative sense, absolutely, things were going to happen in the Roman Empire. Things were going to happen to show them uh, their fall, their doom was imminent. Things were going to happen, and yet they weren't going to, uh, they weren't going to listen to that. So, oh, I think I went the wrong way. Hold on a second. So, the trumpets are sounded for warning. In 1 Corinthians 14, 8, to get ready for battle. Now, if we look at this, once again, numerology in the book of Revelation is so important as we look at this book. When we talked about the tribulation at the end of 6, it was only a partial tribulation because, you know, it didn't show a completeness. As we look at this, what's going on in 8, it says the first trumpet sounded, and once again, we're going through these four trumpets are going to come in pretty quick succession. The first trumpet sounded, and there came hail, fire mixed with blood, and they were thrown to the earth. And what you really need to look at is two things as we go through these trumpets. Number one is the plagues that the trumpets talk about are very reminiscent, very much a parallel to the plagues that occurred with Moses in Egypt. Hail, blood, fire, um, these things, darkness, uh, very much parallel, and they would have reference to this, of what was going on in the book of Exodus as Moses was trying to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. So that's one thing you really kind of need to kind of look at as we go through this. The other thing we need to look at is that in all these cases, as we harm these different things, if you look at it carefully, it says a third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel sounded something like a great mountain burning. A third of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Once again, this is a warning. It's not a, it's not a uh, annihilation. It's not a tribulation at the end of time. It's a warning. How do we know that? Because what are the numbers? What does the numbers tell us? A third. A third's incomplete. Um, we talk about thirds in the book of Revelation. That's an incompleteness. In other words, everything's not going to everything's not going to be destroyed. Everything's not going to be burned up. Everything's not going to die. Literally, what he's talking about is the signs that people should be able to see that the time of their the time of their influence, the time of their power is is going away. The third angel sounded. A star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. Stars falling. Um, waters being bitter. These are all Old Testament references. They would have easily understood. Stars falling from heaven is a, always the fall of a nation or the fall of power. Um, water turning bitter. We see that once again in the book of Exodus where the bitter waters and what would happen. A tree was thrown into the water to make it sweet as we go out of Exodus. In this case, the tree uh, that comes in here turns it bitter. 
and, it's, and he gives it a name called Wormwood. So in this case, we see that, a great star. The name of the star is called Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood. Many men died. The fourth angel sounded, a third of the sun, a third of the moon, a third of the stars. Once again, very Old Testament. When we start seeing constellations being wiped out, constellations dying, it's the death of a nation. We see that over and over and over again in the Old Testament. We saw it in the beginning of the book of Revelation. Once again, this is a warning. This is what's going to happen. You need to look at the signs. So as we begin to look at these trumpets, these trumpets being sounded, these warnings, they're physical calamities against the earth to offer a warning to repent. You know, it's no different than today, really, is it? If you really think about it. There's physical warnings on this earth. You know, we call them a lot of different things, don't we? Global warming or, you know, maybe we call it oh, just a million different ideas that we come up with, right? I think I read something the other day said, you know, the star's on an imminent thing that's going to destroy itself. I mean, you know, there's signs around us that scientists see now that say, well, this earth isn't forever. Well, you and I, we kind of knew that. Not really a news flash to us at all. But this, they're showing that now. Well, this is a sign. You ought to see this earth isn't going to last forever. We're not going to last forever. Our time here is limited. The sun's eventually going to consume us or the you know, gravity's going to change or the tilt of the earth's going to change a few degrees. And they always, all these scenarios, meteorites going to hit us, uh, global warming's going to get us, the seas are going to rise and we're all going to drown. Um, we hear this every day, don't we? Almost hear it so much. We've almost quit paying attention to it, haven't we? Um, I have. You, you know, to me, um, I, hate to, I hate to say this, but I'm an old man, and, you know, I figure the earth's got a few more years left in it, and I guess somebody else will worry about it. But, but the truth is is that, is that we've heard this so much, we almost don't listen to it anymore. It's the same way here. Things happen. If you, if you knew much about this area of the world, about Rome, Italy, um, it's very steeped in seismic activity almost all the temples over there have been destroyed because of earthquakes uh, over and over as we went through italy it'd be like well this temple would be here but there was an earthquake and such and such mount vesuvius erupted covered up uh you know covered up pompeii seismic activity all these things were common in that area look at the signs look at what's going on he would tell them look at your chance to repent well of course they didn't listen no different than you and I or people in this world listen. But as we see this, it's all these different things that are happening. It's the earth, it's the sea, it's the inland water, and it's the heavens. So basically everything conceivably physically is mentioned in these first four trumpets that we can see or look at with our eyes. And all these things that we look at and see are things that John's saying, look at the warning, look at the warning. You know, you need to be able to look and see that this isn't forever. Uh, turn to God. Turn towards God and repent. But, of course, they wouldn't. At the end of chapter 8, it says there was an eagle in mid-heaven, mid which that would be what we could see, mid-heaven. I heard an eagle flying in mid-heaven, saying with a loud voice, Whoa, whoa, woe to those who dwell on the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. So, as we go through these four, we see this damage, we see this going on. And then the eagle, who we see the face of the eagle often in the book, in the Bible, in Ezekiel, um, Isaiah, uh, Revelation. As we see the four beasts, one of them is always an eagle. The eagle is the magnificent, the, the king of the air. And so it would make sense. The eagle would be going through the earth saying, whoa, 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 there's three more yet to come. Three more trumpet blasts yet to come. And, of course, the last of those trumpet blasts is what's going to get us to the seven bowls. So this is a chapter of warning to those who inhabit the earth that, that it's imminent, things are going to happen, and they need to look at what's going on around them, and they need to turn to God, and they need to repent of what they're doing. But if we really look at Revelation 9, we're going to see that they didn't repent as we get into the bowls. And so now they're going to have to face the judgment of God since they failed to repent as they saw these signs around them. You know, some people say, well, there's eternal truths in the book of Revelation. Probably right. Probably true. You know, there's always signs around us. Has been since the beginning of time. Jesus said there'll be wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes, right? And all these things will happen. It doesn't mean it's the end. You'll see all these will be wars and rumors of wars, he says. And yet it doesn't mean it's the end. 
But all these things that go on around us are a sign or should be a sign to us that, number one, this earth isn't going to last forever. Um, I think we see that. Number two, because of that, we should be looking for an eternal home, not a physical home as here on earth, and that we should repent and turn towards God. No different than what he's telling these people here. The same message still applies to us today. And yet, like I say, we've become numb. We don't even listen or look to what we see because we've become numb to what's going on around us. So maybe the message is eternal. I'm sure it is, but I'm sure this message is particularly to those in Rome at this time saying you guys need to look at what's going on. You need to turn back to God. Of course, they're going to fail to do that. We've got three more trumpets to blast. We've got an interlude. We've got seven bowls. We've got a long ways to go. But I hope you're starting to see the picture that John's painting to these people, right? It's, it's coming, coming. Here's a revelation. Interlude. I'm going to seal you. I'm going to take care of those people that are on my own. Don't worry about what's coming. And now we're saying, oh, now here's the warning. Now, this, you ought to be looking around. This is what's going to happen. And then we're going to get to the bowls. It's going to happen. That's where we're moving. So I hope I'm not going too fast. I hope you're kind of seeing how this book's kind of flowing and this revelation's flowing. I hope you're enjoying this study. If there's any way we can help you this evening, won't you let it be known while we stand.